Today, just a background level of ambient EMF in a city is over one trillion times higher than what is found in nature. I do view it as a toxin that is doing real damage that is quite easy to start defending against. People are doing this without realizing the cost to their, their health and their health risk profile. There's not one EMF protection product that actually makes EMF safe. The best ways to protect yourself is to not get those exposures in the first place. Welcome to the Melanie Avalon Biohacking Podcast, where we meet the world's top experts to explore the secrets of health, mindset, longevity, and so much more. Are you ready to take charge of your existence and biohack your life? This show is for you. Please keep in mind, we're not dispensing medical advice and are not responsible for any outcomes you may experience from implementing the tactics lying herein. Are you ready? Let's do this. Welcome back to the Melanie Avalon Biohacking Podcast. Friends, I was supposed to air this episode a few months from now, but I recorded the interview with R and I just thought that the information was so, so valuable. I wanted to air it as soon as possible, especially in time for the holidays, because all of the products at R's Shield Your Body EMF blocking company would make amazing presents. I personally have been using the headsets, the pad for my laptop, some of the clothing. I'm going to be gifting so much of this to people. You can use the code code Melanie Avalon at shieldyourbody.com to get a discount. So definitely take advantage of that. What I really, really loved about R is he's very science-minded. He's very upfront with what is actually happening, what you actually do need to be concerned about. And he completely understands the role of cost benefit, i.e. do you need to be completely crazy and never use a Bluetooth device ever again? No, (laughs) you have to decide what brings value to your life. What is the risk? What is the reward? What truly matters to you? And we live in a world that relies on EMFs. I think it's definitely the best approach to understand that, make the best of the situation. As we talked about in this episode, do what you can to minimize your exposure and then live your life without fear. (laughs) So I really think you guys are going to love this episode. Again, the code Melanie Avalon will get you a discount on all of his products at shieldyourbody.com. The show notes for today's episode will be at melanieavalon.com slash shieldyourbody. Those show notes will have a full transcript, so definitely check that out. There will be two episode giveaways for this episode. One will be in my Facebook group, IF Biohackers, Intermittent Fasting plus Real Foods plus Life. Comment something you learned or something that resonated with you on the pinned post to enter to win something I love. And then there will be a giveaway for an EMF blocking product. For that, check out my Instagram, find the announcement post about this episode, and comment how you are minimizing your EMF exposure to enter to win a Shield Your Body product. So I am super grateful. Thank you so much, R, for that. Okay, friends, exciting announcement. We launched the Serapeptase. Oh my goodness, I did the midnight release and it sold out within eight hours. I do want to say something about the midnight release. I wasn't doing it because I'm a night person. I was doing it because I get super excited about the ideas of midnight releases like they do with books and music. And so I didn't really think twice about it, but I know that people who don't like to stay up late, that that was hard for them. But I will let you know it was available at midnight, but it was also still available at the early morning. So hopefully both night people and morning people were able to snag it. So exciting is we sold out of the complete first run. Like I said, within eight hours, (laughs) um, I was so, so just thrilled. I knew you guys really wanted this supplement, but it was really exciting to see it just light up and just, it was gone. But no worries, you can get it. We immediately started a second run. So yes, you can pre-order my Serapeptase supplement now. You might want to get it before it sells out for the second run because of the intense process that's required to make the Serapeptase up to my standards. They actually came up with an entire new way of making it in the production facility, which just uses a tiny bit of MCT as the lubricant. Every other serapeptase on the market has potentially toxic fillers or the other brands will say that they are enteric coated serapeptase, but they won't list the fillers, but there are likely problematic ingredients in that enteric coating. My serapeptase is so, so incredible, so pure. It has a cellulose and hypermellose acid resistant capsule so that the serapeptase survives the acidity of your stomach and makes it to the small intestine. And then the actual serapeptase itself is formulated, like I said, with a small amount of MCTs. I've been 
when reading studies, and I believe that probably even further enhances absorption. And friends, oh my goodness, it's amazing. I've started taking it myself. I know some people experience GI distress with other brands. There is none of that with my brand. It's high potency. It's vegan, gluten-free, free of all major allergens like wheat, shellfish, dairy, peanuts, tree nuts, even rice. Rice is in a lot of supplements, by the way. It's tested for purity, potency, and to be free of heavy metals and mold. It's in a glass amber bottle. Think about it. Some of these supplements say they're BPA-free, but they're in plastic bottles. <laughs> so that plastic could easily be leaching into the product and the environment. I am just so, so thrilled with this supplement. What is serapeptase? It's an enzyme created by the Japanese silkworm. When you take it in the fasted state, it goes into your bloodstream and it breaks down problematic proteins. So these are things your body may be reacting to or that may be causing issues. So it can help with allergies, clear your sinuses, reduce inflammation. It rivals pain relief of traditional enzymes SEDS without their toxic side effects. Studies have shown it can reduce cholesterol and fatty deposits and even break down amyloid plaque. It can remove fibroids. It can enhance wound healing. Basically, it's the coolest supplement ever. It's just a really healing supplement. I take it every single day and now I get to take mine every single day that I know I can trust and you guys can too. You can get it at avalonx.com, A-V-A-L-O-N-X.com. Again, I can't make any guarantees about when this run will sell out, so you might want to get on that now. It would make amazing Christmas gifts, that's for sure. And I'm just so, so grateful to MD Logic. They really worked with me to create the perfect supplement the exact way I hoped that it could manifest. And guys, I'm so excited. So now that this one is out there and I'm loving it, I think it's time for the next one. Especially now, everything I've learned with the supplement industry, I really just want to create my own versions of everything I'm currently taking. I'll take suggestions for what I should make next. I think I know what I want to make next. It's something I'm currently taking. It's something a lot of you guys are taking. So stay tuned for that. But I would also love to hear your ideas and brainstorming in my Facebook group, IF Biohackers. Another resource for you guys, if you at all struggle with food sensitivities like I do, you've got to get my app Food Sense Guide. It's a comprehensive catalog of over 300 foods for 11 potentially problematic compounds. These are things you may be reacting to like gluten, lectins, oxalates, salicylates, sulfites, thiols, histamines, whether or not something is a nightshade, and so much more. It's a top iTunes app. I just checked and it was number 11 out of all food and drinks apps. You can learn about the compounds, create your own list to share and print, and finally take charge of your food sensitivities. You can get it at melanieavalon.com slash food sense guide. And lastly, we're talking a lot about cleaning up your environment in this episode when it comes to EMFs. Do you know what else is in your environment likely on you every single day? And it may be detrimentally affecting your health as well without you even realizing sort of like EMFs. That would be your skincare and makeup. As it turns out, you're has banned thousands of compounds found in conventional skincare makeup due to their toxicity. These are endocrine disruptors, which mess with your hormones, obesogens, which literally cause your body to store and gain weight, and even carcinogens linked to cancer. It's shocking, and we can make so much improvement in our health and the health of future generations just by cleaning up our skincare makeup. Why future generations? That's because when we have babies, ladies, a huge portion of our toxic burden goes through the placenta into the newborn. It's really, really sad and really upsetting. Setting, but thankfully there's an easy solution. There's a company called Beauty Counter and they were founded on a mission to change this. Every single ingredient is extensively tested to be safe for your skin. You can truly feel good about what you put on and their products are amazing and really work. You see, they wanted to make products that could rival the best of the best on the market while being completely safe for you. Their makeup is amazing. It's what I wear. So check out my Instagram to see that. And their skincare lines, oh my goodness, counter time for anti-aging, counter match for normal skin, counter control for oily and acne prone, counter start for sensitive and counter man for all the men in your life. Or if you're a man for you, I use their vitamin C serum and peel every single night. And right now they have all of these amazing holiday sets. Friends get these sets. They're a way to try some of the best selling products as well as special limited time products all at a discount. You can shop with me at beautycounter.com slash Melanie Avalon. And if you use that link, something really special and magical might happen after you place your first order. Also definitely get on my clean beauty email list. That's at melanieavalon.com slash clean beauty. I give away a lot of free things on that list. For example, if you were on that list, then you got my Black Friday special. So hopefully you got that. You can also join me in my Facebook group, Clean Beauty and Safe Skincare with Melanie Avalon. I do a giveaway every single week in that group for a full-size beauty counter product. People share product reviews, give tips, and so much more. And lastly, if you're thinking of making clean beauty and safe skincare a part of your future, like I have, I definitely recommend becoming a band of beauty member. It's sort of like the Amazon Prime for 
Clean Beauty, you get 10% back in product credit, free shipping on qualifying orders, and a welcome gift that is worth way more than the price of the year-long membership. It's totally, completely worth it. And I'll put all this information in the show notes. Also a quick note, I misspoke in this episode. I was saying that the technology on CGMs was RFID, but it's actually NFC. So I spoke with R afterwards and asked him about that. And he said that the exposure of NFC is more than RFID. So definitely take that into account when listening. All right, without further ado, please enjoy this wonderful, incredible conversation with R Blank. Hi friends, welcome back to the show. I am so incredibly excited about the conversation that I'm about to have. It is with a topic that I am so, so passionate about, and I know a lot of you guys are passionate about as well. I think it's misunderstood. I think there is misinformation and a lot of skepticism, and that is the topic of EMFs. So I've had Dr. Joseph Mercola on the show before about this, but that was a pretty short interview, and I've been dying to dive really, really deep into it for everything. And I was thrilled when Mr. R. Blank reached out to me. He is the founder of a company called Shield Your Body, and And they actually make a myriad of products to help with EMF protection. But he's not just an entrepreneur product creator. He is an expert on this topic. He has co-authored a best-selling book, Overpowered, with his father, who is actually one of the world's leading EMF scientists, which is super cool. He has a degree from Columbia University and UCLA. He taught at USC, which is where I went. So that was really exciting to me. I'm really, really thrilled and honored to be here today to dive really deep into all of this because I have so many questions. And yeah, so <laughs> I'm really excited. So R, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Melanie. That was that was such a nice intro. <laughs> I've been really looking forward to this. And we were talking before, but you guys did send me one of your products. I don't even know what to call it. You put it underneath your laptop? Yeah, we we call it the laptop pad. Okay. I was going to say it's like a laptop pad. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I Oh my goodness. I've been loving it because I use my laptop. I'm at a desktop right now, but I use my laptop every single night. And I, you know, historically was just sitting that right on my lap. So it's nice to know that I have something protecting me, which we can dive deep into all of that. To start things off, would you like to tell listeners a little bit about your personal story? I'm dying to know, well, I guess since your father was a leading scientist, were you destined to be interested in this or (laughs) what was your journey? Sure. So as you and I were just chatting about, because of what I taught at USC, I taught software engineering I was a software engineer. I had a company in LA for about 20 years and I taught at university. I had written a book and um, then it was about 2012 and my father was writing a book. He had a contract from Seven Stories Press to write a book about what he'd learned about EMF and health effects. And he'd been a scientist for several decades at that point. He's a great writer, but his experience was writing for other scientists. And so this book was supposed to be for general audiences. And so he was having a, a little bit of trouble with that. And he asked me if I, could, if I could jump in and help him. And so that's what I did. And for about six months, he and I wrote Overpowered together. And it was, it was a crash course for me. I mean, obviously, you, you know, I, I spent my whole life around him. And for the vast majority of that, this was what he did. But I didn't get into the weeds when I was growing up. I knew we didn't have a microwave oven. And I knew it was because of dad's work. And I knew when I eventually got a cell phone after college to keep it as far away from my head as possible, use a headset. I knew basic things like that, but I didn't understand any more deeply. And that's what the experience of writing Overpowered with him gave me. In addition to that, more specifically, it it made me appreciate that the science here is is very strong, right? So the, the science demonstrating negative health effects as a result of these exposures is it's very strong because you'll hear about it often in in the news, in the media, that there's a debate, oh, does this, you know, do cell phones cause cancer? Do cell phones cause infertility? You know, the jury's still out. And really, in reality, the science is kind of overwhelming that this stuff is bioactive. So that was one realization. The next is these forces are emitted by sources that are central to our entire economy and entire society. 
So there's no way of going back to a world in which we're not exposed to these forces unless we're willing to go back to the 1850s before the light bulb was invented. So I felt that there had to be a safer way of using technology. And that is SYB's mission. I love that so much. Sorry, I'm really enjoying this conversation. And I know we just started, but this is really exciting. Quick question. You didn't have a microwave. They make places without a microwave? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they, they really, yeah, they do. I think I've only ever had microwaves when I stay in Airbnbs. I don't think I've ever had a microwave in a place that I rented or owned. Oh, wow. That's incredible. So many different ways that I would love to go with this conversation. But I love what you said about how it is a real problem. And so EMFs are qualified as a carcinogen or certain types of them are? Yeah. So if I could just step back for a second, for, for those of your listeners, anyone who listened to the Dr. McCullough interview you did, which was great, they'll, they'll know this already. EMF stands for electromagnetic field. And it is a form of energy that, as the name suggests, is made up of uh, electrical and magnetic forces. And there are a lot of different kinds of EMF. They exist on what we call a spectrum. Right in the middle of that spectrum is visible light, like sunlight. Sunlight is a form of EMF. Now, there's certain forms of EMF that have more energy than sunlight. These include things like X-rays and gamma rays. And these are incredibly dangerous, even in very, very small doses, which is why when you go to the dentist and have x-rays, they cover you in a lead coat and the technician actually leaves the room. That's how dangerous they are. Then there's forms of EMF with less energy than visible light. These include things like radio waves and microwaves. And it was long thought that these were biologically inert, that they couldn't harm you or any living things. But science in the past several decades has shown that that assumption was incorrect. Now, to get back to your question, the forms of EMF with more energy than sunlight, those are, are universally regarded as carcinogenic. The forms of EMF with less energy than sunlight, those right now by the World Health Organization are designated as a class 2B carcinogen, which means that the World Health Organization believes and this goes back to, I think, 2011, when that designation was applied, believes that there is sufficient evidence to believe that they are possibly carcinogenic. There is significant movement to try to get them, the World Health Organization, to upgrade the designation to class one, which would be definite carcinogen. But I would also, before we move on, I would highlight, you know, cancer, it's a very serious condition. It's quite justifiably very concerning to people. It is not the only negative health outcome that has been linked to EMF exposure. So can cancer, again, very serious, very important. It should be, in my opinion, designated as a class one carcinogen, but there are many, many other health effects that are linked to, to this stuff. I feel like the benefit with the carcinogen labeling is that it, it makes it seem more credible to people who raise an eyebrow. So to clarify... The waves that are more intense than the visible spectrum, those are a class one carcinogen? I believe so. Yeah, X-rays and gamma rays. I mean, those are called ionizing because they have ionizing forms of EMF because they have so much energy, they knock electrons loose from your cells on contact. And that is what creates the uh, DNA mutations and cell death that lead to cancer. And again, this is universally accepted. No one doubts no one goes around saying, have more x-rays in your life because <laughs> they, they know that this stuff is real. I mean, it's totally non-controversial to, to, to when you say that x-rays are very, very harmful. Well, it sounds like there are a lot of barriers here to addressing this issue. One being what you just talked about with, you know, our entire society <laughs> runs on this technology. I know Dr. Mercola makes a whole argument that the industry kind of treats it like they did with the cigarette industry with like covering up or, or manipulating studies. Have you seen that? Yeah, no, there's actually an entire chapter of Overpowered that uh, is about drawing the parallels between the wireless industry and the tobacco industry playbook. When I heard that part of the interview, it, it resonated very strongly with me. I mean, this, this happens all the time. It's, it, the more money that's in an industry, the more power they have to do this sort of thing. But this is how science operates today. 
companies can fund studies in ways that are designed to produce specific types of outcomes that they can then be used in their lobbying and their their public relations and so forth. So I, it's totally in my mind, it's totally non controversial to say that that uh, that's how they they operate. Like historically, would we have been exposed to ionizing radiation before the invention of these technologies? So almost almost none. I mean, so you know, some of this uh, certain radioactive materials are are naturally occurring, but no. I mean, basically, until the invention of the light bulb. And, and, and really, I think it is, it, it's important to sort of focus the conversation on the non-ionizing forms of EMF because that's what is emitted by modern technology. That's what the cell tower is emitting. That's what your Wi-Fi is emitting. That's what they're de- deploying more and more and more of these sources in our lives every day. But until the invention of the light bulb, the only forms of EMF that anyone in all of human history in fact, all life on Earth in the world's history was exposed to was sunlight, the Earth's own magnetic field, and lightning. Those were the only sources of EMF until around, well, the mid-19th century when the light bulb was invented. Once you had the light bulb, they created a power grid to power the light bulb. That was another source of EMF. Once you had the power grid running to all these houses and throughout all these cities, people started building new appliances to run on that network. And those became sources of EMF. Eventually, they realized you could use these signals to communicate wirelessly. So you had the invention of radio and television and radar. Those were sources of EMF. And it just keeps exploding all the time. So, you know, there's a wide variety of estimates, but one of the more conservative ones that I I like to cite is that today, just a background level of ambient EMF in a city, that is, you're not holding a phone up to your head, you're just walking around, is over 1 trillion times higher than what is found in nature. And that's, you know, that's a 24-7 exposure. That's all the time. Have our bodies adapted at all to this, like since we're born into this now, presumably? Not really. I mean, that's not the scale of time at which evolution, and I'm, I'm, I'm not an evolutionary expert, but I can tell you from, you know, what I've learned in school, that's not the order of magnitude, right, that, that we evolve on. It takes you know, thousands of years for that sort of stuff to really change. Plus, add to that the fact that the amount of EMF in the environment now is many orders of magnitude greater than when you were born, right? So even if you had evolved to cope with the damage caused with the level of EMF in the environment when you were born, there is way, way more of it today. And there'll be way, way more of it in two years and five years and 10 years and 20 years, because the, the number of sources just keep exploding, in essence, because this is entirely unregulated. I know Dr. Mercola and you had a great discussion about the FCC being a controlled agency and thus stifling regulation. And that's largely about cell phones, which is a very important subject. But really, you know, most of this stuff is actually entirely unregulated, cell phones being an exception. Most as you walk around the the street, right, the amount of EMF that the power lines emit, that's entirely unregulated. The number of different sources to which you can be exposed simultaneously is entirely unregulated. So it's not just that the regulatory agencies are controlled, it's that there's essentially no regulation at all. And there that's why you are having more and more and more of this stuff deployed into our life. I mean, just look around. I mean, I I, I don't see your room right now, but let, let me assume it's like a normal, you know, average room these days. Look around. Look at how many different sources of EMF are in that room. Compare that to when you were a kid and then think what's going to happen in another 20 years. Is it safe to say that if it plugs in or is electronic, it's emitting EMFs? Yes. So there's a couple, if you'll recall, I mentioned that there was this spectrum of EMF, the, e, the electromagnetic spectrum. And I mentioned things like radio waves and microwaves. Those radio waves and microwaves are emitted by anything that communicates wirelessly. Then there's a a form of EMF with even less energy that's called ELF or extremely low frequency. And that's emitted by anything that runs on power. So that includes your kitchen appliances. It includes the electrical wiring in your home. It includes the power lines and transformers out on the street. Anything that runs on electricity is a source of EMF. And anything that communicates wirelessly is a source of EMF. What about 
like infrared energy, like red light and near infrared. Is that an official EMF? Yes, that is a form of, so just like ultraviolet is a form of, you know, just that has just a little bit more energy than visible light. Infrared has just a little bit less energy than visible light. So it is a form of non-ionizing EMF. I am not aware of much science on, on that particular set of frequencies. It's also not a particularly common, you're, you're not surrounded by infrared, sources of infrared everywhere that you go. So in terms of dose, we're just exposed to much, much, much less of it. But, it, but to answer your question, yes, it is. It is a form of EMF. I wonder about it because I have my red light near infrared devices and I, I run them a lot, pretty much 24-7 in my apartment. And I know a lot of my listeners have the devices as well. And I have them for their beneficial health effects, but I do wonder about that. Another question. So is there a difference in the health effects of acute exposure to maybe a more potent non-ionizing form compared to just this chronic baseline background? Like, is the effects of little amounts consistently just as bad as like a more acute exposure or is it not even measurable that way? Sure. No, no, it's a great question. So, and I'd like to start answering it this way. So, you know, I mentioned, and you talked about this with Dr. Mercola, the amount of radiation a cell phone can emit is theoretically regulated. And there's a whole lot of reasons why that isn't actually true if you want to talk about that. But let's say, in, in theory, it is, right? That there, there is a certain amount of radiation that these phones can give off. And that is based on something called the thermal effect. So what's that mean? That means enough of this EMF, enough power, right? If, if you're exposed to EMF with enough power that it can heat and burn and cook human tissue. And it might sound surprising, although, you know, you have a microwave oven. That's exactly what a microwave oven does. A microwave oven emits enough microwave EMF with, so, with enough power that it can actually heat and cook your food. So there are certain levels of power of this type of EMF that can actually heat and burn your body. That type of damage is carcinogenic. And that's exactly why these safety standards do exist. So it is for certain that at certain levels of power, it is even more damaging. Now, in terms of you know, what's worse, one acute exposure or 30 years chronic lower level exposure, I mean, at that point, there's a, there's a lot more variables involved. I will say that there is a demonstrated dose response relationship in the EMF science. So that means you know, the more of it you're exposed to, the more likely you are to experience these a wide variety of, of negative health outcomes. And those doses are both in terms of power and in terms of duration. That is really telling if you think about it with the microwave actually cooking things. Quick question. They say that the microwave is a Faraday cage and none of that radiation exits the microwave. Is that true? No, that is not true. So they are shielded. They are regulated as to how much radiation they can leak at the time of purchase. I forget that number offhand because most of the time people ask me about cell phones. But there is, there, there's an amount, and we cover it in Overpowered, there's an amount of radiation a microwave oven is allowed to leak at the time of purchase. The thing is, that's all based on the seal of the, the door, right? So if you read the manual, you're supposed to actually have your microwave serviced every certain period, every year, every two years, in order to restore that seal. I, I've been doing this now for about 10 years. I've yet to encounter someone who has ever had their microwave oven serviced. And so at the time of sale, it's allowed to leak a certain amount. And then over time, that amount will increase. And that's exactly why they say pregnant women should not be using microwave ovens. I mean, that is a takeaway. I mean, most of my listeners, <laughs> I don't want to make assumptions, but I feel like a lot of my listeners might not even be using microwaves, but if you are servicing. If people want a demonstration of that, all they have to do is put their phone in the oven. If you want, unplug it first, just to make sure you don't accidentally turn it on when your phone's in the oven. But put your phone in the oven and call it from another phone and it will ring. Mm, that's brilliant. 
I'm going to do that right after this. <laughs> and another, this is sort of a random question, but so like when we use the microwave, we turn it on, the EMFs happen, then it's done. Like do the EMFs linger? Where did they go? No, they dissipate. So so EMFs just travel and they dissipate rapidly. So power of EMF radiation diminishes exponentially with distance. So as you double the distance between you know, the source and where you are, you're cutting the power of the exposure by 75%. So they go out into the world and they event- eventually diminish off into nothing. Oh, that was my second question. So they do become nothing? They don't just keep... Correct. And they, they diminish in power quite rapidly, which is exactly why... You know, when, when people like me say, don't carry your phone in your pocket, that's why that matters so much. Because when it's in your pocket, you are getting the strongest possible dose off of this device. Even if you have, if, if you're carrying it, you know, which it, sh- it should still be further away than this, but even if you're carrying it an inch away from your body, your exposure is going to be significantly less than if it's actually in your pocket. And that's also why, you know, when you're using a microwave oven, you want to stand as far away from it as possible, ideally, you know, in the next room, because the power of these waves really diminishes rapidly. Hi, friends. I'm about to tell you how you can get 15% off my number one biohacking thing. Yes, my number one biohacking thing. So there's something I keep getting asked recently. I got asked in Dave Asprey's virtual biohacking conference. I got asked on two recent podcast interviews I did. Everybody keeps wanting to know, what is my number one biohacking thing? It's really, really hard because there are so many incredible things which truly upgrade and enhance my life. But I've been thinking about it a lot. And honestly, probably the one quote biohacking thing I cannot envision my life without is my blue light blocking glasses. I've been using blue light blocking glasses for years and they are a game changer. In today's modern environment, we are way overexposed to blue light. It's a type of wavelength naturally found in daylight. It's also very, very high in artificial light and computer screens. Now, blue light is good because it keeps us alert and awake, but our overexposure to it today is not so good. All of the blue light that we are exposed to leads to things like excess stress, headaches, anxiety, and insomnia. If you're having trouble falling asleep at night, get blue light blocking glasses now. Every single night of my life, I use my blue blocks, blue light blocking glasses to take charge of my light exposure. Blue blocks makes clear computer glasses. You can use those throughout the day, especially if you're staring at screens a lot. They still let in blue light, but they block a lot of the damaging excess blue light. Blue Blocks also makes their summer glow glasses. Those are tinted with a special yellow color, scientifically proven to boost mood, and then they also block more blue light as well. Finally, Blue Blocks has their Sleep Plus glasses. Guys, you've got to get these. You put them on in the evening and they block 100% of blue light. A lot of the blue light blocking glasses on the market aren't actually blocking the blue light like you need to be blocking. That's why Andy founded Blue Blocks. All of their glasses are tested to block that blue light and they come in so many styles so you can definitely find a pair that you will love. Oh, and they can make them in your prescription as well. You can save 15% off site-wide. Just go to blueblocks.com and use the coupon code Melanie Avalon to save 15%. That's B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com with the coupon code Melanie Avalon to save 15%. Also definitely consider getting the Remedy Sleep Mask. I also use that every single night of my life. It's amazing. It has zero eye pressure, but complete blackout. Basically, you don't feel it on your eyes, but you can completely open your eyes and and it still blocks 100% of light. It's so comfortable, so incredible, and I can't imagine sleeping without it. And guess what? For every pair of Blue Blocks glasses you buy, Blue Blocks will also donate a pair of reading glasses to someone in need. How incredible is that? And we'll put all this information in the show notes. All right, now back to the show. Yeah, one of my like really prevalent memories from childhood is probably the first time that I went and stood up next to the microwave and was like staring, like looking at it. And my mom was like, you know, step away, not allowed to do that. Another question. So just on a more cellular level, what do these rays actually, or EMFs actually do to our cells, especially in relation to the calcium balance and things like that? Yeah. So, okay. So at that point, yeah, you're getting into, into some of the, the biological effects. So I think the studies that, that you're talking about, you, that you're trying to get at with this question, they relate to something called the voltage gated calcium channels. And Dr. Martin Paul 
has uh, a series of studies on that, which are the I'd say probably the most widely referenced. And what he has shown is that exposures to this type of radiation, like you would get from a cell phone, impact these these uh, calcium channels. So these VGCCs, the voltage gated calcium channels, they control how much calcium gets into your cells. That's important for a, a lot of, of biological reasons, but. It, just think of it like that's how your body's designed to work, right? You have these little gateways on the cell, and they're designed to allow a certain amount of calcium into the cell. So what, what Dr. Paul has shown is that the EMF can impact these VGCCs and allow excess calcium to flood into the cells, which in turn is a mechanism for creating oxidative stress. That is actually, I know your listener, you, you, cover, you cover oxidative stress in, in, in a lot of different episodes. So that is one of the mechanisms right now that is known about the impact of EMF exposure on the amount of calcium in our cells and what that can do. And for listeners, the show notes for this episode will be at melanieavalon.com slash shield your body. And I will put links to the studies there so listeners can check those out. So is that the primary mechanism of action with the, the oxidative stress and the, the voltage gated calcium channels? I probably said it wrong. Well, when it comes to, to calcium levels, yes, that is right now what my understanding is what the science is indicating in terms of of, of how EMF exposure impacts calcium channels. And it is one, one mechanism by which oxidative stress is induced. It is not the only biological mechanism that EMF exposure triggers. And so what are some of those other issues? Sure. Well, one, one set of important studies that, that now goes back about 30 years is by a couple of doctors, Dr. Henry Lai, Dr. Narendra Singh, who, who showed that using a cordless phone, because at the time it was a cordless phone, it was the early 90s, using a cordless phone led to DNA strand breaks. So a strand break is, I mean, DNA is made up of these strands. And when it breaks, you know, that, that, that's bad because you're breaking down the structure of DNA. Now, there's, there's two forms of strand breaks, right? Because DNA is made up of two strands. So if you break one strand, that's called a single strand break, and the body will, right, because you have two strands, it'll go to the other strand and say, oh, I think I know how to fix this, right, because it's a mirror image. But that process is sometimes, they, it gets it wrong, right, and uh, that's where mutations can enter, and that is a mechanism by which diseases like cancer can form. The other is a double strand break, and that's when when both strands in the cell, the both strands of DNA break, and then the cell doesn't have enough information to repair. And so at that point, what likely happens is uh, cell death. So it'll actually kill, the cell will kill itself rather than live on and spread bad information through the body. So, and that was just from, from 15 minutes of exposure to cordless phone radiation. Even more concerning out of those studies was how they showed that this damage persisted for hours after the exposure. So the damage kept occurring for hours after the exposure. And again, it was from a very low exposure. It was from about 15 minutes of exposure. That is some of the seminal work in terms of DNA damage, because DNA damage is a very, you know, it's a very significant and harmful outcome in the body. Were these in vitro studies looking directly at the cells, or was it like people holding a cell phone? Or, uh, sorry, a cordless. No, so the, these are laboratory studies done on samples, not, not on humans. Presumably, it would be the equivalent, right? Because it would be like the phone to the cells. I'm just wondering, can you pretty much extend that to real-life implementation of using a phone? Well, so these studies were done on, on living rats, not, not on, on humans, but they were done in the lab. So they were... For some of this science, you know, you can study humans. For, for other topics, it is considered largely unethical to, to do those types of studies. So that's why you can't, you can't study humans. But the Lai and Singh studies were, were performed on rats. How are the studies set up when they do test for safety and efficacy, I guess, with the cell phones? They don't really test for safety. The way that works with cell phones 
in in the U.S. and in many countries. It's a little different because the the, the regulatory agencies are a little different in all these countries. There is a a level of radiation that is determined to be the maximum that a phone can emit, and so people think right. So when a cell phone is released. They think that that is a regulated amount of radiation that they're at max getting from that device. There's several problems with that. And I won't name all of them because we could spend the whole interview on this. But when people think that the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, regulates cell phones, right, they think the FCC must test these cell phones. And the answer to that is they do not. Companies themselves commission these tests, companies themselves publish the results. So when your Apple iPhone says, and I, you know, it's different for every model and I've read, but you know, 1.1 watts per kilogram, that was never determined by a government agency. That was determined by a lab that Apple hired. Another issue there is that you can determine the position of the phone during the test. So if you ever read an iPhone manual, it actually explains that there needs to be a minimum distance of separation between the phone and your body in order to maintain at or below tested levels. So that means basically Apple is saying, don't hold the phone up to your head, except that's exactly how they've designed the product. And you wouldn't know that they're saying that unless you read the fine print in their manuals. So the actual position of the device during the test can be completely controlled by the, the cell company that, that's commissioning the test. A more extreme example of this, and I'll get back to cell phones in a second, a more extreme example of this is with Dell laptops, where if you read the manual for certain models, it says you need to keep a minimum of seven inches of distance between the laptop and your body. The product they call a laptop, you need a minimum of seven inch distance between the product and your body in order to maintain safety levels. But it gets even worse than that. I mentioned this number or these units, right? I said 1.1 watts per kilogram. The actual limit is 1.6 watts per kilogram. That is a unit of something called SAR or specific absorption rate. And what that's supposed to mean is how much radiation does your body absorb when you use the device? Now, the problem with SAR is that it's based on a dummy that is, I believe it's six foot tall. That emulates, it's a dummy, it's not a real human, but it emulates a six foot tall, 220 pound man. That dummy emulates a body that is bigger than 95% of the human population, which means that 95% of the human population will absorb more than what the test shows. I hope I explained that correctly because it is a key way in which these regulations are obfuscated and, and circumvented, right? So, because when these regulations aren't based actually, they're not based on how much radiation a phone emits. They're based on how much you absorb from that phone. But the way they measure that absorption is with a dummy that emulates a man that is bigger than 95% of the human population and way bigger than children. So for these reasons and more, which I don't want to bore everyone by going into them, but these regulations don't actually protect us. So I'll give you a specific example here. A few years ago in France, the government decided to test, it was about 300 models of cell phones. And they found that almost all of them emitted more radiation than the manufacturers claimed in the documents. Several actually emitted more than were legally permissible and were actually recalled from the market. So that's what happens when a governmental agency actually tests these devices. Because right now, it's, all, it's effectively all based on the honor system. So basically, when they're doing these studies, I'm assuming they probably set it up in their favor. They probably set it up the way the device is, quote, supposed to be used. I'm assuming they put in that distance that they recommend. And then on top of that, use a dummy that is bigger than a normal human person or <laughs> than most people. Than most humans, yeah. And then on top of that, the devices are also releasing more than they say. So it's just so many confounding factors in their favor. That is super, super upsetting. I mean, I was just thinking, because I've had David Sinclair on the show, he has a whole book on aging and like his thing is DNA. And I remember reading his book and he only like barely mentions any of this. And I was just thinking, this is maybe a silly question, but 
do you think because it's invisible, like it's something that we can't see that we're just not taking it seriously? Yeah, no, it's so A, it's invisible. Not only is it invisible, it's odorless. You can't touch it, see it, smell it, taste it. It's very easy to pretend it's not there. Two, it's kind of a little bit complicated, right? I mean, just listen to how much we're talking about the, you know, frequencies and wavelengths and watts per kilogram and all these units people have never heard of. So that makes it even easier to ignore. Third, it comes from all of this stuff that people just love and are addicted to. And, and to, you know, we have to be honest, right? Adds a lot of value to society. It's not like cigarettes where it's really just a vice and you could get rid of all tobacco on earth tomorrow and the world would be just fine. It's not like that at all. Because if we actually got rid of all EMF tomorrow, you know, something really bad has happened. You know, we can't refrigerate our food. We can't communicate with our loved ones. We can't call an ambulance. There are all of these things that, you know, we just depend on. And so you, you take all, you, you have, it's, it's, it's hard to understand. It's very easy to ignore because as you said, it's invisible. And it, it comes from all of these things that we love. Those create huge obstacles to creating public awareness of the concerns and the risks and just even believing for a minute that this could possibly be true. So you were speaking about how it's been increasing and it is increasing. Is it an exponential increase? Yeah. Yeah, it is. I, it, you you kind of have to extrapolate it from other numbers, right? Because there's, there's not like a global EMF index. But there is, right, you can check, you know, how many smart devices were sold, how many IP addresses have been allocated, how clogged is the network? I mean, that's one of, one of the main reasons for 5G is to create much more bandwidth capacity for all of these devices, these smart devices to be communicating. And the reason it needs to exist is because our, the number of devices that are connecting and the amount of data they're sending is so much greater now and is projected to continue growing. So yes, the, the growth of technology is exponential. An exponential growth in the number of sources also means very significant growth. I'm not sure yet. I, I have to look at the number. I'm not sure if it's exponential, but just in data transmission requirements. So how much data we're sending over the net, these networks. And all of that translates into more EMF exposure. So yes, it is exponential growth. Do you think it will reach a point where, like, I don't know, it wipes us out? Like, <laughs> like, will it reach a point where it will actually be catastrophic? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's a good question. I haven't really thought of it in those terms. I would say no, I don't. I mean, so, the, you know, think of it like lead, lead and water. And you have this huge infrastructure where you suddenly realize, shoot, all the plumbing has lead in it. That means all our water is tainted. And that's really bad, right? I mean, when, when all the, the water supply has lead in it, that's really bad. But it's not like everyone just drops dead. There's ways of treating the condition. There's ways of remediating the sources of the exposures. It's not like EMF is the only toxin in the world. It's not even necessarily the worst toxin in the world. And I'm saying that as someone who's obviously very concerned about EMF and making technology safer. There, society, while it brings a ton of benefits, and which can be measured in any number of different ways, from life expectancy to productivity to infant mortality, right? All these different ways that you can measure the benefits of modern society. For all of those, there's any number of different toxins that you could identify. I named one already, lead and water. You have microplastics in the oceans. You have antibiotics in the, the, the meat supply. You have all of these different things that are, you know, we know are toxic. The, the, the issue with EMF is that, as you, you, know, you noted, it's invisible, it's odorless, you can't touch it. People are addicted to the sources of EMF. And so when you have lead in water, when you have microplastics in the oceans, when you have mercury in our fish and antibiotics in the chicken. No one goes around saying, you know, get me more lead in my water. Get me more microplastics in my ocean. I don't have enough of them, right? Get me more mercury-laden tuna. No one goes around saying that stuff about those toxins. 
When it comes to EMF, everyone is clamoring for more EMF. And that's one of these mental roadblocks that people like me are working hard every day to try to break through. It doesn't mean that that these exposures will one day culminate into, you know, a cataclysmic event, which is the end of life on Earth, right? I think we're, 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 we're approaching that. For, we're doing a fine job of approaching that with other threats. I do view it as a toxin that is doing real damage, damage that a lot of people don't yet appreciate, and damage that is quite easy to start defending against, right? So when you have lead in the water, you can't just filter the lead out of the water. I mean, you can go, if, if, if you have enough money, you can go buy bottled water from, from a store instead of getting it through the tap, right? But that's, that's just one, ex- one example. You, actually getting rid of the lead in the water is a fundamental repiping of the, the entire infrastructure that got the water to you. When it comes to EMF, there is a lot that needs to be done on the broad societal level, but there is a tremendous amount that people can do just in their personal lives to engage more, more mindfully and more healthily with the technology that surrounds them. And so that is what you know, I and SYB spend our time really focused on. Yes. Well, I just want to take a gratitude moment to say thank you for what you're doing. And I'd love to get into that topic. A few last quick questions about what we were talking about. You mentioned 5G. I get like confusion surrounding that. Is it actually active now or is it coming? It's active. I mean, it depends where you live, but in most, I think it's every U.S. city now it's active. But just because it's active in your city doesn't mean you have coverage where you are. It has definitely been deployed throughout all the cities in the United States, increasingly throughout multiple countries around the world. So yes, it is, it is active. The reason I had like confusion surrounding that was I feel like there was like a time where it would say 5G on your phone, but they were saying it's not actually... I th- yeah, I think, I think what you're talking about is 5GE. Yes. Yeah. And that was a marketing gimmick. I forget which, which company did it. Was it Verizon or AT&T? Well, yeah, I just clicked on my iPhone and it says 5GE, which I had gone into the settings and changed it not to be that, I guess, an update. Yeah, 5GE isn't 5G. 5GE is 4G. And the, I for, again, I forget which carrier did that, but they were actually sued for misleading marketing and actually had an out-of-court settlement. So it's just a very, it was just a marketing ploy to get people to think they, they had 5G, access to 5G sooner. So that was the probably part of the confusion surrounding that. Also, what are like smart meters? Is that something else? Sure. Yeah. So smart meters. I feel very naive with these questions. I just hear these, these terms. No, it's, I mean, before 5G, smart meters were the, the, one of the major drivers of concerns about, about EMF exposure. So in the United States, we all know we have these various utility meters. We have power meters on our houses. We have gas meters. We have water meters. They measure how much we're using. In the United States, there's been a drive to convert our power meters into smart meters. And what that means is the meter itself actually becomes a wireless device. And instead of a meter reader coming to your house to read how much electricity you've been using, it's actually communicating with a central location, sending that data wirelessly. Now, I mentioned in the United States, it's power meters. The reason I say it is because actually around the world, in certain countries, it's water meters or gas meters that are the primary driver of these smart meters on the homes. But in the United States, it's, it's really mostly power meters. And these power meters are like having a cell phone mounted to your wall that is communicating, not constantly, but all the time. So the reason I can't tell you exactly how long is because this is an example of one of these unregulated exposures. And There are, I don't remember the number offhand, but it's something like 20 different standards for smart meters. So some communicate, you know, multiple times a second, some communicate, you know, a couple times an hour, and you don't really know which one is mounted on your home. And if you call the power company, they probably won't be able to tell you because the customer support rep that you're talking to has no idea what you're talking about. When they bubble it up, they're told we don't distribute that information. So you can't even get access to learn what type of meter has been put onto your home, what type of communication protocol it uses. But it is like having a powerful cell phone running effectively 24-7 attached to your home. 
And that's why a lot of people are upset and concerned and worried about the impact that this is having. In some areas, you can opt out. You may have to pay a fee, but in other areas, they won't even let you opt out. And you are required. If you want power, if you want power service to your home, you must have a smart meter attached to your home. That is concerning. Speaking of the like the constant running of that, so Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, both equally concerning. Is one more concerning? I know. So I have an Aura Ring which uses Bluetooth, but I put it into airplane mode. I don't know how concerning it is when it's in airplane mode, but I lost it and I downloaded this app to try to find it. By it was an app that basically shows everything Bluetooth around you. Oh my goodness. It was overwhelming. I was like, there's so many things. Because then I was like trying to retrace my steps and going out in the world with this app. And I mean, it was just overwhelming how many Bluetooth things showed up. So Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, how bad are they? So first off, they both, they're, they're almost identical forms of, of EMF. Wi-Fi run, generally runs, at, it's called 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz. Bluetooth is 2.4 gigahertz. So like I say, basically identical forms of EMF. The key differences between Wi-Fi and Bluetooth involve distance, right? So just like a cell phone is designed to communicate over possibly miles, right? In some situation, your phone can actually communicate miles to reach a cell tower if it has to. Wi-Fi network is generally, and you know, it can vary based on the hardware that you have, but generally designed to run over hundreds of feet. So Wi-Fi a Wi-Fi router is generally lower powered than a cell phone, again, because of this, this distance thing I was just saying. Bluetooth is even lower powered than that because Bluetooth, while Wi-Fi is designed to communicate over hundreds of feet, Bluetooth is generally designed to run over 10, maybe 30 feet. And so because you know cell phones are miles, Wi-Fi is hundreds of feet, and Bluetooth is 10 or tens of feet, right? You're getting diminishing power of the emissions. And so Bluetooth and Wi-Fi are very, very similar forms of EMF, but a Bluetooth device emits it with less power. So from that perspective, you might be tempted to think that Bluetooth is less harmful than Wi-Fi. The flip side of that is a lot of these Bluetooth devices are designed to be worn on your body for extended periods of time. So that includes not only, you know, the smart tech, the wearable, like that you, you mentioned your ring. It also includes things like AirPods, which you see people walking around with for hours, little kids walking around with for hours. So it might be a lower powered exposure, but it is right up against your body and it is for an extended period of time. And so it's, it's really, I, I have a hard time telling people that Bluetooth is safer because it's really not. It's lower powered, but again, because of the use cases, the exposures can be significantly more. Now, add to that the, the consideration that it's not like Bluetooth is, is a substitute for Wi-Fi. It is additive to your Wi-Fi exposure. So it's not like the, this, when you started wearing this ring that you mentioned, it's not like you took another source of Wi-Fi out of your life. You didn't. All your Wi-Fi exposures stayed the same, and then you added this ring. That's another source of EMF exposure in your life. So it's not like they're substitutes. It is additive. It is increasing your cumulative exposure. So in general, you know, my approach, I mean, so if you have, okay, I'll give you an example where this does make sense or where this can be helpful is right with, with Wi-Fi calling. I don't know if you've ever heard, have you heard of Wi-Fi calling? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So with Wi-Fi calling, you can turn your phone into airplane mode. So you can turn off the cell connection and turn on the Wi-Fi connection. And then you can still make and receive calls. And then your phone is actually emitting less EMF to you and into your environment. And so that's an example where Wi-Fi is actually substituting for cell data. And by using it, you're actually reducing your overall exposure. With most of these things, you're not evaluating them as substitutes. And so each new thing becomes a new source of EMF in your life, not one that's just replacing a higher powered source. It's, it's, it's a new source and it's increasing your cumulative exposure. If you had to choose between 
at your home environment, having your phone on and having Wi-Fi off. So like normal phone, but Wi-Fi off compared to Wi-Fi on, but phone off. Because this is like a practical question that I would implement. So for people who've actually gotten rid of Wi-Fi from their homes, I don't advocate them to put it back just to support Wi-Fi calling. But most people still have Wi-Fi. And so I, for, for those people, I strongly advocate using Wi-Fi calling instead of cell data. Because, the, the, I mean, it really is a significant difference in how much radiation your phone is emitting. And also, before I forget, one of your earlier questions talked about airplane mode, and I, I don't think I got to that. The answer is airplane mode is very helpful. So when you put a device into airplane mode, it almost entirely eliminates the EMF exposure. There'll still be like a tiny little bit because anything that runs on power is going to emit some, even if it's a, a low power battery, it'll emit a little bit. But really, by and large, it is, it is such a reduction that generally I tell people it actually eliminates all of it. Because it, it, when you're eliminating the wireless cards, the radiation from those connections, you're basically eliminating all of the EMF from that device. Question about the Wi-Fi. I was asking about that because I keep the Wi-Fi off as much as I can unless I have to turn it on for something. So I was wondering if I should be making that switch, but it sounds like not. No, I wouldn't. I Yeah, if, if, you've, if you've made the accommodations in your life to keep Wi-Fi, you know, always off or mostly off, then keep doing that. I've hardwired. I use Ethernet for my computer. I turn it on when I'm gone because it runs my security system. I turn it on if I'm using my laptop. I should probably work on that to get a, to hardwire my laptop. Question about the Wi-Fi though. I did go in, I had to call them to do this. So you couldn't do it yourself, but I made it so that it just uses the 2.4 rather than the five. Does that matter? Yeah. And depending on, so what you're talking about is, so a lot of Wi-Fi routers that you'll get from your, your internet provider these days, they're what, what are called dual band, which means that they're designed, they're one router that's designed to run two different networks. And one will run at 2.4 gigahertz, and one will run at 5 gigahertz. And when you're running two networks, you're doubling the exposure. And so it's smart if you just turn one of them off. It's from the sound of it, you had to call your, your ISP to do that. It was not easy to do. And they were like, why do you want to do this? And I was like, please just do it. <laughs> yeah. But for some people who, who maybe know how to, to access the admin panel on, on a router, you, for a lot of them, you can just do it yourself. But either way, it's, I, I, I strongly advise that. And probably you're going to want to keep the 2.4 gigahertz one running and disable the 5 gigahertz because the 2.4 gigahertz, well, it depends what you want to achieve, but generally the 2.4 gigahertz will get you better reception in more of your home. Oh, really? It travels farther. Oh. The lower the frequency, the further it will travel at the same level of power. Okay. So harm wise, like EMF harm wise. No. So harm wise there. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the science isn't, isn't sufficiently detailed really to, to be able to tell you the exact differences, but by and large, what we see is there is, there is health risk from exposure to all of these different frequencies at different sets of frequencies. You will see different sets of health risks emerge over time. So you know, the health risks from the type of EMF that come from a power line, right? The science is showing that those over time, you know, they accumulate, those are different than some of the specific health outcomes that we're seeing from cell phones or, or, or Wi-Fi, right? So over, you'll see different sorts of diseases and negative health outcomes in different areas of the spectrum, but that you, you get these health risks from all, I mean, that's one thing that the science is showing. There isn't a safe frequency. I just assumed because it was five, it just sounded more intense and so it would be more harmful. Yeah, that's not what, at least not my reading of the science. And I, I, haven't, I haven't heard anyone argue or that point, but maybe there are people that do, but that's not my reading of the science. My reading of the science is that all of these frequencies are bioactive. There's basically no safe level of this stuff. And, it, and the, regardless of which frequencies you're, you're, you're talking about. Do you think there would be a benefit to switching between the 2.4 and the 5 so that you're not having chronic exposure to 1? Mm, I, I, I don't know enough to answer that question. 
That's just where my brain is going. I like I like how inquisitive your mind is, but no, I, I unfortunately do not know enough to answer that question. My my intuition would be there is no benefit. Who knows? Yeah. I mean, that would be my intuition as well, but I was just curious and I highly doubt they're ever going to test that. Yeah. So the, are you familiar with Aura Ring? No, I am not. I mean, I heard about it in your in your interview with Dr. Mercola. That was actually the first time I'd, I'd heard it. Okay. Yeah. So it's a wearable. It's a ring. I've had the founder on the show or the CEO on the show twice. I love it. <laughs> it measures your heart rate variability, your respiration, your temperature, and your activity levels. And it syncs via Bluetooth with your phone, but you can put it into an airplane mode where it's not communicating with your phone. And then you can, you turn it back on by putting it on the charger. But their studies on it show like very, very minimal emission. I'd have to look at the actual testings, but like, so how concerned should I be? Like it brings a lot of benefits to my life. So I know you don't know the the testing on it for what it's emitting, but what are your thoughts on that concept? Yeah, so uh, you know, obviously, because I don't know the product, I can't comment on the specific product. But what the question you're getting at is a great one, and it's a fundamental one, and it's what I spend my time telling. Because you know, I don't spend my time telling people get rid of technology, stop using technology. I mean, I, as we started this conversation, you t- talking about, I had a 20 year career in software engineering in California. I was surrounded by tech, not just in my life, but in my, my entire world. And I realized there's tremendous benefit to be had in technology. What I advocate against is, is mindless consumption of this technology, because it, it, people are doing this without realizing the cost to their, their health and their health risk profile. And what you're getting at is it's, it's a fundamental decision or, or way of approaching technology that is one that I advocate. Which is it's specific? It's engaging in a cost-benefit analysis. You had another one earlier, which I noted when you said you turn on your Wi-Fi for your security system, which is another one where you decided the the functionality of the security system was one that you wanted, and you're willing to engage in in these exposures. Maybe in that example, you're not home so much when they're on, but even so, you're willing to to have these exposures in order to to enable that particular functionality without which you know you would lose some tangible value in your life the same thing can be said of this ring that you're talking about which is if you and you sound like an inf- you, you know the EMF issue is not a foreign issue to you you're aware of this and even given that you believe the value that this ring brings to your life is such that it justifies it i think that is i mean that's entirely reasonable i mean i have a cell phone I, I keep it in airplane mode a tremendous amount of the time, but you know, I run a company. I have to be, you know, when I'm out, I, I have to be able to be in contact with people. And so it's not like I, I don't have a cell phone, even though I think cell phones are very, very harmful from an EMF exposure perspective. What I, ad- what I advocate is people engage in this, right? They don't just go out and go buy the tech that emits EMF when they don't need it. And you see this all the time these days. You see it with smart fridges. I mean, I've never met anyone who actually benefited from a smart fridge. You, they have smart kitty litter boxes. They have smart hair brushes. They have smart, I swear, smart tampons. They do? Yeah. There is a company out there making and selling smart tampons. What do they do? They say like they say that they're like full or something? <laughs> <laughs> they provide some type of biometric feedback on the process. But of course, that's in a super, not only have, have women gotten away or, or survived just fine with regular tampons for, for so long, that one is in a particularly sensitive, it's emissions in a particularly sensitive area, very close to, to the eggs and to the uterus and, and other, other sensitive bits. Anyway, that's all by way of saying there's a tremendous amount of stupid smart tech out there, stuff that you really just don't need, that you're only buying because it sounds cool, your friend bought it, or you saw a great photo of it on Instagram, and your body isn't trained, your mind isn't trained to realize, I don't need that exposure, right? It doesn't add enough value. But there are plenty of exposures in life that will add enough value. That you, you can't go through life without increasing your health risk. I mean, just going out and driving to work is increasing your risk. So you can't live a life without risk. 
And you can't live a life in modern society without exposure to EMF. What I advocate is, is going through the decision-making process like you just explained with that ring. And uh, I think that was a great example for your listeners of the type of thinking. So it's not about swearing off technology at all. It's about engaging mindfully, deciding what tech actually brings real value to you. Okay, that is a refreshingly encouraging, amazing perspective. And yeah, it definitely goes into all of my decision making. Like I bought sort of recently a simple human trash can, which I am obsessed with, but they have an option for like, you know, the hands free open. And I was like, oh, I really want that, but like, I don't need that. I can just open it myself. (laughs) So one more question about this whole topic that we're talking about right now. A lot of my listeners and I included, have you ever worn a continuous glucose monitor or are you familiar? No, but one a person, I can't remember when, it was over a year ago, but a person emailed me about this for their child. Wait, was I think the child was severely diabetic and the the he had been prescribed I think it's what you're talking about. I'd have to go through my emails and figure it out. But I believe he was prescribed what you're talking about. And she was saying, you know, I'm really worried. You know, his diabetes is very serious. He needs this. But I'm worried about the continuous exposure. And my reply to her was, you know, if he really needs this, that's a great example of something that's providing a lot of value. And it clearly, you know, justifies the exposure. And so if you're concerned about his EMF exposure from this device, then try to make reductions elsewhere in his life. But don't stress about this life-saving technology that he is using that is also exposing him to EMF. I I know I cut you off on your question. I apologize now for doing that. But did that answer what you were going to ask? Yeah. Historically, Therefore, diabetes. So they monitor your blood glucose levels like 24 7. But now they're becoming available to the general public because they're really, really wonderful methods of seeing how your body responds to food and diet and exercise. So you get a picture of your blood sugar, you wear them on your arm. So I, I wear one a lot. I'm not right now, but I've, I've gone a few months wearing them, and a lot of people in my audience have tried them. One of the questions I've been having with them now is historically they used, are you familiar with RFID technology? Yeah. So you just would scan it to transmit the information. Now they're moving towards Bluetooth. And I actually just had a call the other day with a company that wanted to come on the show and talk to me about their program, but they're using the CGM that only runs on Bluetooth. And I'm trying to make this decision right now. I don't know. Like, I don't know, cost benefit of that, like wearing a Bluetooth device on your arm for two weeks would be how long people would wear it if they're doing it just to see how they respond to things. What are your thoughts on that? RFID and then Bluetooth on your arm for two weeks. Yeah. So RFID, if I'm assuming it it would need to be scanned, right? Yes. Yeah. So that would be almost no, yeah, that would be almost no exposure. Bluetooth, if it's a, for a fixed period of time, it all depends on what it finds, right? I mean, if, if, if it helps you, if, if the data you're going to get in that two-week period is, is really going to help you live a healthier life, who knows if the, the Bluetooth exposure is, is going to be, I mean, it sounds like it, it, could, it could be totally justifiable. I mean, if it's really going to help you live a healthier life, getting that data, that makes a lot of sense to me. I try very hard not to wear, wear any EMF emitting tech, right? So I would never wear a smartwatch or, you know, what is this new thing? uh, The Facebook uh, Ray-Bans from Facebook. I would never wear those. I wouldn't probably wear, oh, I certainly wouldn't wear AirPods. But what you're talking about, it's for a fixed period of time. It's not too long. And, you know, if you're really going to make use of the data to live a healthier life, I mean, you know, you can't say in advance how much healthier that data is going to make you versus, you know, what the impact of the Bluetooth is. So that's just one of those things where you're going to have to decide, is it worth, you know, is this data going to really help me live a healthier life? Am I going to actually take advantage of it? If so, if it's just for two weeks, you know, sure. I mean, that's a personal decision. See, like right now it's at a point where some of the companies are still using RFID, which is great, but I think they're probably all moving towards Bluetooth, but I'm hoping in the future, future, they will have some sort of airplane mode. So 
I guess we'll just wait and see what happens with it. So I'd love to dive into like all of the products that you are creating. One last question before that. You were mentioning heavy metals and lead and mercury. So actual quote EMF sensitivity, are some people more sensitive to EMFs than others or and or is it like a bucket thing where like if you have a certain level of oxidative stress, that matters? And or I was asking about the heavy metals. I've heard that people who have heavy metal toxicity might be more reactive. So just that whole question. Yes. So the answer to your question in terms of EMF sensitivity is yes, there are people who are more sensitive. Um, There's a condition known as electrohypersensitivity or EHS. It also goes by some other names, electromagnetic illness. Uh, Some people call it Wi-Fi allergies. And you can think of it like an allergic reaction to exposure to this type of radiation. So You know, if you and I walk into a room and we're fine, someone with EHS might walk into that same room and experience symptoms of varying degrees of severity from uncomfortable all the way up to intolerable. They could be rashes, pains, auditory effects, a complete inability to sleep, severe anxiety. It's not a universally recognized condition, but it is recognized formally in multiple countries in the United States. It is recognized in Medicare billing codes. So while while the government doesn't say it's an official condition, your doctor can actually bill Medicare for this condition. I did not know that. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that. So it is a real condition. There are, it's hard to treat, but there are some places like the Women's, Cos- uh, the Women's College Hospital in Toronto, a few others that have formal treatment regimens. It's still a poorly understood condition, which means it's also the prevalence is poorly understood. The estimates range quite quite widely, anywhere from let's say three to fifteen percent of the population. Some estimates have it even more. I believe that a lot of people have it without even realizing they're having it because if you're having anxiety, if you're having insomnia, severe insomnia, if you're having rashes, you might have no idea that that could be. be because of your EMF exposure. You might attribute it to something else. And a ton of people these days have sleep disorders and anxiety disorders and so forth. So on a conservative level, you know, certainly a certain percentage of the, of the population has it. I believe it's much more than that. But what I was going to say is I, I think what we're going to see is more and more and more people have it, right? Because the, as, as we've been talking about, the amount of EMF in our daily environments, particularly in urban environments, it just keeps growing every year. And that means more people will be, will, will be exposed at a level that hits that threshold after which they realize they're having these symptoms. Whereas you know, two years ago, three years ago, the EMF was lower. Maybe they weren't at that threshold. Now, getting back to the other aspect of your question, which was susceptibility given other uh, sensitivities. Yes, my understanding is other toxicities contribute to EHS and EHS contributes to other toxicities. So this would include, as you said, heavy metal. It would include multiple chemical uh, sensitivity, MCS. It includes Lyme disease. These are all examples of conditions that have cross susceptibility with EHS, where those conditions make you more likely to be EHS and EHS exacerbates those other conditions. That is mind-blowing about the medical code. I did not know that. That's so helpful. So making practical changes and mitigating our exposure in our daily lives. So you've touched on a lot of it already, you know, just making those conscious decisions about what you do and don't actually need in your life that might be emitting EMFs. Like the things I've done, the Wi-Fi, like I mentioned, I use the the ear pods, which I realize you make ear pods, right? Air tube headsets, yes. Yes. What is the the converter, the hard converter that you have? Yeah, so that's a little bit different. So the hard is it's it's basically a filter. So well, let, let's actually talk about the problem first. That both products, the air tubes and the hard, are designed to 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 protect against, right? So you should never ever hold a phone up to your head. That's a that's an absolute universal rule. So that means either using speakerphone or a headset. Now, speakerphone isn't always convenient if you're out in public. You don't want people hearing everything. If you're trying to listen to a video or a podcast, it's not great. So that leaves headset. 
Now, using a regular headset, and I mean regular, like wired, not AirPods or anything like that, using a regular headset is much, much, much safer than, than holding a phone up to your head, like so much safer. I don't want to confuse anybody about that. That you should, when given the choice, always use a headset instead of holding the phone up to your head. The issue is, though, that traditional headsets, they're made, they, they, they use wire, right, to conduct the sound from your phone or whatever device you have it plugged into up to your ear. And that wire can conduct some EMF. So regular headsets, while they are much, much, much safer than holding a phone up to your head, they still conduct some EMF from the phone up into your ear canal. And so anti-radiation headsets are designed to cut that radiation flow off. So they don't stop your phone from emitting EMF, but they do stop that EMF from being conducted up the headset into your, into your ear. So air tubes do that by not using wire, right? So they, they actually convert the sound in, instead of sound conducted over wire, sound conducted over air through tubes, hence the name air tubes. And they're very effective. They also, you know, leave a little something to be desired when it comes to sound quality because you're conducting the sound over air. So that's where the hard comes in. The hard is an adapter. So you plug it into your phone or your laptop or your Nintendo Switch or whatever you're using. And then you plug your headphones into the hard. And the hard has a, a, a pack of, inside of it, it has a pack, a little pack of dielectric gel, which absorbs the stray EMF and converts it into a tiny amount of heat, which then dissipates. So it's a way of filtering the stray EMF off of the signal. So that allows you to use standard headsets. It not only doesn't diminish the audio quality because you're actually filtering out this stray EMF, which is a form of interference, you actually get improved sound quality. In fact, that's the technology was initially developed to improve sound quality, not, not to protect against EMF, but that ended up being a byproduct. The headphones I have in right now are, I got them on Amazon though, they are air tubes. I'm going to order yours right after this. Do you make one that has the adapter for the iPhone? No, we do not. And I get asked this question all the time, nor do, nor do we make air tubes for the iPhone. That Apple charges a tremendous amount in hardware royalties to use the lightning adapter. The iPhone is the only product you need that for. You don't need that for the MacBook or the iPad because they use regular connections for those devices. And it looks like Apple's going to have to abandon the lightning for iPhone anyway, because yeah, the EU has passed a law to protect consumers that basically says everything has to be USB-C. So, and this just happened, so it's going to take some time to take impact, but it's because Apple, it, it's just the economics Apple makes it very, very expensive to build hardware that works with the lightning adapter. And so that's why we don't do it. The European Union passed that law? Like, is that going to affect them for the US? Well, if they want standardized iPhones around the world, it will, which is probably what they're going to do. Okay. So in the meantime, if we get your air tubes and I use a little converter thing, is that going to add back the EMF? No, that'll work with the air tubes. It doesn't, unfortunately, work with the hard. It, it works about half the, depending on the, there's so many of these lightning adapters and they're of varying quality and about half of them don't work with the hard. So we just tell people not to use the lightning adapter with the hard, but they all work with the air tubes. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Okay. That gel, do you think there's the possibility in the future of like a lotion that you would put on that would do that for your body? Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't want this gel on my body, but I have thought about... <laughs> more daydreamed, but about, I mean, we, we use sunblock to block UV rays and we can put on clothes to block EMF, certain EMF shielding apparel. So why can't we do an EMF sunblock kind of product or lo EMF lotion? Yeah, I, I suspect it's possible. I haven't seen it done and I haven't heard of anyone doing it. Oh my goodness. If you want to do a project together in the future, <laughs> I would be like so down. I'm creating my first product right now. So I'm like, in entrepreneur mode. I'm like, oh, all the things. That's amazing. 
Hi friends. One of the most valuable things that I do every single night of my life is my infrared sauna session. The brand that I use is Sunlighten. I did a lot of research on infrared saunas before deciding on them. Their saunas are so high quality. They're low EMF. And what I really love is they have a solo unit. That's what I have. And it's really great if you live in a small apartment, might be moving. It's just really an amazing investment and they have incredible deals and offers on it right now. You can actually get up to $200 off with the code Melanie Avalon, or if you're talking to a rep, just tell them that I sent you. And like I said, that will be up to $200 off and that will also get you $99 shipping. Normally the shipping is like $600. So that's a really, really big deal. And if you do purchase a sauna, forward your proof of purchase to podcast at melanieavalon.com. And I will also send you a signed copy of my book, What, When, Why. If you'd like to learn more about the science of sauna, two resources. I interviewed the founder of Sunlighten, Connie Zach. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And then I also recently did an epic blog post all about the science of sauna. I will also put that in the show notes. All right, now back to the show. So the, the cell phone stuff that you have, and thank you for taking the time to talk about this. I get so many questions from listeners about wanting these products. So this is going to be so helpful for them. So the cell phone products that you create, one of the ideas out there is that putting a case or something on your iPhone, actually, I I keep saying iPhone, on your phone might exacerbate the problem because then the phone has to work harder. What are your thoughts on all of that? All of my products and all EMF shielding products use these shielding materials that work. You can think of them like Faraday cages, right? Because they block and deflect EMF radiation. And so my phone pouch, for example, is made with this shielding material. My uh, baseball cap is made with this shielding material. My uh, boxer briefs are made with this shielding material. And so it's an EMF shielding material. If you were to fully wrap your phone in this material, your phone would compensate because you're then obstructing the signal. So your phone would compensate by boosting the power to, to work harder and harder to get the signal out there. So that could lead to increased exposure it certainly would drain your battery. And so that's why I don't make any products that are designed to fully wrap your electronics, whether it's your phone or your tablet or your laptop. None of my products fully wrap your your device for that reason. So to answer your question is, yes, what, what you're talking about is possible, but when a product is, when a shielding product is properly designed, that should not be the result. Okay. And actually, I'm so glad you discussed all of that because that was one of the questions I had, like physically blocking, you know, through these products or whatever you're using, physically blocking these EMFs. Like if we could see the EMFs and like if they were colored and we could see them, like when they hit the block, do they go around the block? Do they absorb into the block? Yeah, they don't go around and they don't absorb. There are some materials that absorb, but but my products don't absorb because when they absorb, they, they convert to heat. And so it heats up. So my products just deflect. So you can think of it like a window shade blocks sunlight. My products block EMF. And what that means is they deflect and bounce in the opposite direction. The question I always have when I'm thinking about my phone and blocking things is if it's still on and it's still receiving the signal, like how is that actually protecting me. It's hard for me to visualize like how it's protecting me if part of the phone is covered. Okay. So that's a great question. And that's all about how it's designed to be used. So that's why, for example, I don't make a phone case. I make a phone pouch. I also have the phone shield and the pocket patch and the sling bag. Those are all designed to make it safer to carry your phone. So I'll use the example of the phone pouch because that almost almost six years old now, and it remains my most popular product. And what with the phone pouch, only the back is shielded. The front is not. And so you put your phone in the pouch, and then you put the pouch in your pocket or on your belt. And because the back of it is shielded, the side between the phone and your body, it deflects radiation away from your body, but still allows your phone to communicate. And the same principle applies to all of, all of the products under that menu on, on my store, right? So even the sling bag, which is like a little cute little backpack, that only the, the back of the bag, the part that comes into contact with your back, only that part is shielded. 
So that's how it reduces your exposure to your device's radiation, but it still allows your device to communicate. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. That makes more sense. But I, I don't do cases because I don't want any product that even implies that it is ever safe to hold a phone up to your head. Because that's what a lot of these phone cases are designed to, to do, to quote unquote, make it safer to, to talk on your phone up to your head. I don't believe in that use case at all. I mean, I think people shouldn't carry their phones in their pockets either, but that is less harmful. And it's also largely unavoidable for a lot of people a lot of the time. Like they have to carry their phone. Where are they going to carry it? There, there is no excuse for, for holding it, talking on the phone up to your head, in, in my opinion, which is why we don't, at SYB, we don't make phone cases. I very, very rarely ever hold it up to my head. The only time would be if I'm in some sort of environment and I, for some reason, don't have my headphones and I have to do a call. And the visceral response in my body, like I am so, I just think it's so bad. I, I like I'm shuddering when I'm like holding it up to my head. So I just wish everybody could, could get there. And then like at Christmas, one of my family members gave everybody ear pods and I was like, oh no, oh no, <laughs> please don't use those. So for women who carry their phones in their purses, there would be a benefit to putting the phone into the pouch. Okay. The clothing, do you wear EMF blocking clothing every day? I do. Well, every day, no, but I live in a very, very low EMF area. Uh, SYB is, is based in, in, in Nevada. So I started it in Vegas. I've been traveling quite a bit since, uh, since COVID hit and I, I prefer to stay in in kind of undeveloped areas. In terms of the apparel of them, well, the boxer briefs are super, super comfortable. I love wearing those when I go into the city. I also love the neck gaiter. So that's like a neck tube or sometimes called a buff, although that's, that's actually a brand name, but people call them buffs. So it's like this tube that you can put around your neck. And because it's just a tube, you can wear it now all these different ways. You can wear it like a scarf. You can wear it like a beanie. You can wear it like a balaclava. It, it, it can be worn in, in over a dozen different ways. And it's made from this material that's 90% silver, 10% spandex. It's a great, I just love it. And I, I have a, as you probably saw, I have a, a shaved head. So I, I'm a big fan of head protection and just in general. And so I, I really love the neck gator. And the, the newest form of apparel, I don't have one yet because all of the production samples were taken by other members of my team who wanted it more, but is the wristband which is designed specifically for, for people who use smartwatches, which is another thing which I advocate strongly against. But for all of these things, the best solution, my, I consider my products, and I want, I want your listeners to know this, right? My products are a backup for when the primary methods of defense don't work, right? Because the primary methods of defense are what the stuff we've been talking about, which is, you know, not buying that source, that new source of EMF, or turning off your Wi-Fi at night, or keeping your phone in airplane mode when you carry it, not keeping it on. Those are all the best sources of defense. The best ways to protect yourself is to not get those exposures in the first place and to to keep them as far away from you as possible when you are having them. So all of my products are a second line of defense. And so that's true for all EMF protection products everywhere. There's not one EMF protection product that actually makes EMF safe. It makes certain exposures safer. That's, that's what they do. The things that make it safe are not having the exposure in the first place. So a good example of that is smartwatches. I, I hate smartwatches. I did a whole webinar just in August about how dangerous I view, I, I view them and how people shouldn't use them. But I'm also a realist and I know that people do use them, which is why I created the wristband, which is, it'll probably be shipping by the time this episode airs. Awesome. 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 Question. So I do have an EMF canopy. I was using it for a while. And then I read that if it wasn't properly, I don't know if it wasn't grounded or something that I could be making matters worse. So then I was like, Oh, I don't even know. So I took it down. (laughs) Um, I know you sell canopies. What are your thoughts on the canopies? Yeah. So that's a very good question. So the canopies are great. So it depends what you're trying to shield against. And, the, and, and we also offer consulting through SYB with certified EMF specialists. And this is one of the questions we get a lot in the consulting 
And so Kathy, who's, who's our senior, senior specialist, she, she spends a lot of time talking about this. I talk to her about it a lot. What it really boils down to is if electric fields are the big source that you're trying to shield against, then you really need to, to, to think about other solutions. But if, if you're looking, if, if, if the, the, the high exposures uh, are coming from radio frequency and magnetic fields, generally the, the lack of grounding is not increasing your exposure. All that said, if you needed to ground the canopy, you can with an attachment. And so it all depends on the specifics of your particular environment where you're trying to actually add the shielding, which is a great example of why we offer consulting, because you can see just by that answer, it already got complicated and a little boring. I'm riveted. <laughs> I'm like thinking about my, <laughs> my canopy. Yeah, because you always should be thinking, especially with something like the canopy, you know, with a product like this, the phone pouch or the laptop pad or the headsets, you know, it's obvious what they're protecting you against. When, when it comes to these, lo- the, these uh, larger products designed for in-home protection, you re- it really does need to be based on what you're trying to protect against in your home. And so not, it's not, there's, there's no one-size-fits-all type of protection for EMF. There's so many different sources, and they can interact with each other very differently and lead to... So, so you really need to, if you're trying to provide you know, large-scale in-home protection, you really need to put a little more thought, research, and effort into it than, than would normally go into just buying, like I say, like a phone pouch or a laptop pad. With the whole canopy thing, like this really speaks to what we were talking about with the like the invisibleness and the nebulousness. Like I, I put up the canopy, then I read that about the grounding and the thing came with this sheet and instructions on how to ground it. So I, I did all of that, but then I was like, I just don't know. I was like, I don't know if like, I don't know if this is making it worse. So the fact that you have this consulting, how does it work? Do they come to your house or is it like a phone call or? So through SYB, it's all through Zoom. So you book, you pick the time on the website when you're doing the booking, you pick the time and the Zoom room is created and both of you show up and there's video, you can get a recording of it. You can ask whatever questions and get them answered. If, If you're in the area where she is, you could actually schedule an in-person consult, but the problem is most people aren't. So no, it's all handled. It's all handled on online through, through Zoom. Awesome. This is amazing. Okay. I'm so excited. Do you sell the paint? No. Okay. Do you have thoughts on the paint? Yeah. I mean, so with all the, the so I was just explaining with the, with the canopy, the same thing sort of applies to the paint as well. Like once you start getting into these kind of larger scale home defense kind of implementations, you really need an expert because it's very easy to get it wrong. And A, it's expensive. And B, if you get it wrong, you can actually increase your exposures. So you need to work with an expert like a certified EMF specialist from the Building Biology Institute or perhaps someone else who might be in your area to actually implement that type of scale of a shielding solution. I'm a big fan of the paint. I, I, let me just be clear. It's a great product. The, the one I, I know of is called Y Shield. It's a great product. It does what it says, but it's also very kind of complicated to do it right. And that's why I strongly advocate, you know, people actually engage with, with qualified specialists before attempting to do something like that. I have a meter and I mean, it's not my language. So (laughs) basically I just walk around with it and things look like they're bad, but I don't really know what it means. How do you feel about people using EMF meters and testing things? Wow. Thank you for asking this. I am a huge advocate for people doing that. And, you know, as a starting point, you need to start with a a decent meter. You don't need to spend thousands of dollars on a professional grade meter, but you can't get these $30 meters off of Amazon and think they're going to do you any good. So, you know, the meters I recommend start at about 160. And that would include like the Trifield TF2 and the Cornet ED88T and a handful of others. So I actually have a guide. It's available for free on my site. It's at shieldyourbody.com slash test. And it is, it is a really good guide. So it recommends several meters so people can choose which one looks like it's right for them. Uh, functionality, price point, maybe if they could get it delivered more quickly, whatever it is. I don't make any commission. I don't make meters. So I just recommend ones that I think are good. 
And then I have a whole bunch of, of tips. Well, actually, before that, I actually explain, like you said, it's all, uh, I forget the word you use, but effectively it's gibberish. So I have a whole bunch of pages that explain what these units are and what they're measuring. And then I have a bunch of pages that have how to do it and you know tips to do it right and to get good readings. And it's a great guide. It's now in its sixth edition. Like I say, it's free to download on my site. What I, I'm actually excited to talk about, because I've been doing that ebook, that guide, I've been doing that for years. It gets better every year, but I've been doing that for years. I've actually just last month launched something, and this is actually the first time I'm talking about it on a podcast or, or anywhere off of, off of my YouTube channel, really. That is called the SYB EMF Health Effects app. So when you go to my site, you'll see it up in the NAV Health Effects app. And this is meant to help plug a gap, right? So I'm a big advocate of learning how to test. I understand also that these readings can just be very confusing. And you can kind of look at it and compare it against a chart and say, how does this compare to what so-and-so, like the Building Biology Institute says, is a, a high exposure or a safe exposure, whatever it might be. But that's about all most people can get out of this. Now, people like me come on podcasts like this and tell people like you, Melanie, like there's so much science. There's so much science showing that this stuff is harmful, that this stuff is bioactive. But there's a real disconnect between what you're seeing on the meter and actually understanding how that relates to the science. So what we did is we created this app, has about a thousand studies in it so far. And you can go to this app and you can enter a reading from your meter. And then it will show you a bunch of high quality, published, peer reviewed science showing health effects at or below the level that you've entered into the app. So it's actually a way of connecting the reading you're getting off of your meter in your home or your office or your kid's school or wherever you're doing it and seeing what actual science says happens at those levels of exposure. That is fantastic. Congratulations. When did you launch that app? September 22nd. We celebrate a holiday here at SYB called EMF Radiation Safety Day. A lot of years, you know, we'll have a big sale or we'll do a contest. This year, the big reveal was this app. That, that was the, the big celebration. For, uh, I guess we're, we're, we're a little bit dorky about EMF, but to us, that was the big celebration was releasing this app. So that was just a couple of weeks ago. Oh, that's incredible. I am sharing that with my audience ASAP. That's so exciting. And the guide that you mentioned, super grateful. So we have a link for listeners. You can go to shieldyourbody.com slash Melanie Avalon. That is the link to the guide you're talking about, right? Yeah, I've, we can add it to that page. We have a lot of guides. Okay. This is good to clarify. Okay. Yeah, no, no. It, the, the, that guide's a great guide too. So that one is about the five best ways that you can cut your EMF exposure right away without buying anything. And so that includes things like not carrying your phone in your pocket. But it, it's not just those five things. It also explains why those five things are the most important things that you can be doing in your life to reduce your exposure. So that's the guide that people, I, I would strongly encourage people to get at shieldyourbody.com slash Melanie Avalon. Okay. So that guide and then the guide you were speaking about is on your website as well. So we can put a link to it. Yeah, please do. Yeah, let's do that. And I'll send, I'll send you a direct link to it after this too. So you can, you can see it for yourself. I think you'll, I think if you have a meter, I think you're really going to like the guide. Yeah. So I pulled out the meter. The one I have is GQ EMF 390. Does that ring a bell? It does. It was in the, that price point ish. It is not one of the meters that I recommend. It has an impressive feature set for the price point for sure. I'm very excited to get your guide because I realize I just don't have that knowledge or information about how to use it. So I've been using it very casually. Um, <laughs> so I'm very excited to get your guide about it. And then also super, super grateful. So if listeners would like to get their own products from Shield Your Body, which I'm pretty sure they will want to, I'm going to go stock up right after this. You can use the coupon code Melanie Avalon and that will get you 15% off. So thank you so, so much. I am just thrilled about that. This has been absolutely amazing. I have one more last question. It's a product, but it's not one of your products. Have you heard of Somavetic? I have heard of it. 
but I can't I can't recall specifically what it is. I've I've definitely heard the name. It's this glass housing that has semi-precious and precious stones on the inside. And they say that it mitigates EMF and they have literature on their website. One is published in a journal. The other three are studies that aren't published in a journal, but they were, I mean, assuming they're accurate, they're pretty impressive. So they sent me one and I was like a little bit skeptical, (laughs) but the difference I started seeing on my aura ring scores, which shows the heart rate variability in the sleep was shocking. Like, I don't know, it really seemed to make a difference. So I bought another one for my bedroom as well. But I'm just curious if you have thoughts on this idea of stones. And then the interesting thing they say about it is they say that it takes like a few weeks to reach maximum potency. So I'm confused about like, what is it doing to like take time to change the environment? Do you have any thoughts? If this is like out of your field. Well, in general, I, I try not to comment on specific companies anyway, except my own. But but I will say in general terms, I know people who have tried products like this and some report tremendous success. Others report no impact. Some report tremendous success, but then build up a tolerance over time and then it doesn't work as well. So, you know, my opinion with any of this stuff where, where the mechanisms aren't clear, maybe the, the supporting evidence isn't, isn't entirely clear, is, you know, if you want to try it, try it. And if it works for you, keep using it. I mean, that is, that is my approach. Because, you know, I get questions a lot about, you know, brand names aside, about organite and shungite and other certain stones and gems. And my, my answer is the same, which is, you know, especially if you've tried other things and those haven't worked and you're kind of desperate for some relief, you know, try it. And if it works for you, keep on using it. And if not, stop. Okay. Awesome. Like I said, it's, it's very pricey and they sent me one, which was amazing, but I was very skeptical, but I don't know the effects I saw. I was like, Oh, okay. So then I went and (laughs) read what they had written and then I um, bought another one as well, but okay. I like that approach. Well, thank you. This has been amazing. we covered so much. Was there anything else you want to draw attention to that we didn't touch on? No, I mean, this has been a fantastic, (laughs) I don't think I've ever been interviewed by someone who enjoyed it quite as much as you did. So that was, that was a real kick for me. I really appreciate, I really appreciate your enthusiasm for this topic, the detail with which you kind of approached your questions. This was great. I really appreciate it. I hope your listeners really appreciate the effort that that you've put into this. This is great. Thank you. No, they're going to love it. Normally when I record the interviews, it's pretty far out that we air it, but I'm, I'm going to try to bump this one up because this is just, <laughs> I just want to get this information out there. And this was absolutely incredible. I am just so, so grateful for what you're doing. And that's perfect because the last question that I ask every guest on this show relates to all of that. And it is, what is something that you're grateful for? Well, right now, given that it's 2021, I, and, and especially everything that happened last year and even this year, I am just very grateful to have a, a stable life, a stable home, a stable business, and a loving relationship. That's the kind of over, overwhelming sense of just gratitude at just things being nice and normal. I know that might be kind of a boring response to that question, but right now that's, that's, that's a lot of the gratitude that I'm feeling these days. It's not boring at all. I think it's absolutely wonderful. And um, I'm, again, like I said, so grateful for everything that you're doing. Again, for listeners, the code Melanie Avalon will get you 15% off site-wide at Shield Your Body. This has been absolutely amazing. I look forward to all of your future products and developments, and hopefully we can talk more in the future. Excellent. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Melanie. All right. Thanks, R. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to the Melanie Avalon Biohacking Podcast. For more information, you can check out my book, What When Wine, Lose Weight and Feel Great with Paleo Style Meals, Intermittent Fasting, and Wine, as well as my blog, MelanieAvalon.com. Feel free to contact me at podcast at MelanieAvalon.com and always